Hello everybody, welcome to this session about Groovy and in particular Groovy in the light of Java 8. Um, I'm Guillaume Laforge and I'm working uh, on the Groovy project. I've been working on it for the past 10 years. Um, if you want to stay up to date with Groovy news, I'd like to plug this uh, a uh, weekly uh, newsletter every, every Tuesday. Uh, there's a weekly uh, dose of news uh, about the, the Groovy uh, project, Groovy ecosystem, etc. So if you're interested in Groovy or already use Groovy but want to uh, get more information about the, uh, the ecosystem, don't hesitate to uh, subscribe to that little newsletter. So the goal of this talk is to answer a question that uh, we've been asked once in a while, uh, do we still need Groovy now that we have Java 8? You know, Java 8 I, has got lambdas now, um, so is it what makes Groovy Groovy, uh, the, the closures that we have, or is there anything more? Or uh, do Groovy developers benefit from Java 8 as well? So this is the kind of questions uh, we'll, we'll be trying to answer. So to those who said no, please leave the room. But no, no, stay there. Don't worry. Um, so, more precisely, uh, you know, you've got lambdas, we have closures. Uh, what's the difference between them? When to use one or the other, etc.? Or should Groovy support the syntax of lambda, uh, which is a bit different than the syntax of Groovy closures? Uh, yeah, how we can benefit from Java 8 or uh, where Groovy tries to go beyond what uh, Java 8 offers. If you look more closely at the feature list, uh, so it's not a complete feature list, of course, but just uh, uh, trying to draw parallels between Groovy and Java 8, uh, I, I'm particularly focusing here on the new syntax elements of Java 8. So closures I mentioned versus lambdas. Uh, in Groovy 2.3, we added the notion of traits which somehow can be mimicked with a default method in interfaces. Uh, we've ha we have a pretty rich way of handling truth, null handling, etc. Uh, on the other hand, Java provides uh, optional. We've got uh, tons of additional uh, methods on top of the collection API to do functional programming with collections, and Java 8 adds uh, the stream API method closures, which are our equivalent to method references. So there is some redundancy between the two. So what should we be doing? Should we just use what Java provides or sometimes Groovy might do things differently, etc.? cetera? We, we have to decide. And not all the decisions have actually already been taken. So your feedback is useful. Uh, if you have anything to say about a particular uh, topic I'll cover later on, don't hesitate to uh, make your voice heard. So in Java 8, uh, I, I'm not going to do a you know, Java 8 crash course covering all the, all the features, uh, but I, I want at least to uh, you know, contrast the two and show you um, uh, how they uh, behave, uh, what, what are the similitudes and so on. So in Java 8, uh, we'll focus particularly on the new syntax elements, also a bit on streams, uh, the date time API, a few words about the Nashorn JavaScript engine, and basically all the, all the other aspects are more about the platform, sometimes the API, and um, nothing particular. Uh, it's not that it's not interesting, but it's not of particular interest to that uh, talk today. And uh, the, on the Oracle website, there's a, a nice, concise resource with uh, more details about the, the, those features. But in just one page, uh, although there are quite a bit of uh, new items, new things in Java 8. So let's focus on the syntax part. Uh, Java 8 got lambda expressions, method references, etc. We'll cover uh, basically all these ones. Uh, Improved type inference, it's a compiler thingy, not really uh, something specific to a, a language construct. And method parameter reflection, it's, a, it's related to a reflection and it's something that uh, Groovy can also benefit from, but nothing uh, I can contrast uh, between Java and Groovy. 
So let's start with. Yeah, it's a lambda. <laughs> it's a kind of lambda, a lambda expression. So the typical example um, so you have a, a stream of students and you want to filter those who graduated in 2011, then you want to get their uh, scores and you want to find the, the maximum score uh, for uh, all those students for, uh, from 2011. Uh, so you notice uh, here in bold, that's the lambda expression. Uh, so there are parameters, you've got an arrow, you've got the, the body of uh, the lambda expression. And what's interesting, if you look at the API under the hood, uh, filter takes a predicate, uh, but here you have a lambda expression. So somehow the Java compiler transforms that lambda expression into a predicate. So a predicate, the predicate is actually a functional interface. And Java 8 adds several uh, functional interfaces like uh, consumer, like, uh, well, there are uh, quite a few which are uh, available and have been added in Java 8. Uh, so there's no function type. So that's the first difference with Groovy, because in Groovy you have a closure class that you can use and access and handle and pass as parameter, etc. Another interesting thing is that actually you see all those methods are somehow chained. So you call filter, you call map, you call max, uh, you know, chained way, uh, chained method calls. Uh, what's nicely done is how it's being done in uh, you're actually kind of building a pipeline and then you do a single pass over the collection. So you, you don't create intermediary collections. Uh, once you've filtered everything, up you create a new collection, then you map, then it creates another resulting collection, then you find the maximum. So no, it's done as a single pass and you get the result at the end uh, with the, the last uh, call here, the, the max operation. Uh, with Groovy, uh, we, we, when you use the standard Java collections, uh, so here instead of a stream, you'd have a, a list of students. We already, we, we already had methods like find all, which is like the, the filter. We had collect, which, was like, uh, which is like map from Java 8 uh, on the streams. So you would do students, find all. So it's a bit shorter because we've got uh, shortcut notations for uh, the property uh, the property, uh, the, the Groovy properties, or, uh, well, like, uh, you know, you've got getters and setters, you can use that notation in, in Groovy. Um, and we also have the it parameter, which is the, the default parameter of a closure. But the, uh, the drawback compared to streams is that uh, we actually do create intermediary data structures. So it's a bit less efficient that what uh, the, the Java stream uh, can do. There are some variants of those methods for iterators, so it's closer to the pipeline approach where you do a single pass, but we don't have iterator uh, variants for all the methods. But what's interesting is that uh, Groovy provides the same kind of coercion uh, from a closure to a predicate, just like Java 8 does with a lambda expression transformed into a predicate or predicate or any other uh, functional interface. So here, uh, instead of, uh, if you remember two slides earlier, instead of this uh, Java 8 lambda expression, uh, uh, and I'm back to the new slide, here instead I'm using a closure, a groovy closure uh, is delimited, delimited with uh, curly braces, it's the same arrow, and you can use the stream API uh, with Groovy closures. So actually, strictly speaking, we don't really need to support the syntax of lambda expression, since after all, we have uh, Groovy closures. But some people may disagree and think it'd be better uh, for, uh, let's say, a copy and paste compatibility between Java and Groovy. Uh, perhaps it would be nice to support it. So your opinion uh, is interesting if, you, if you've got a if you've got a preference, one way or another, don't hesitate to shout. And beyond that, um, the, the lambda expressions, so this is the, well, usual uh, 
syntax for uh, lambda expressions where you have a parameter. Uh, here, if you've got two parameters, you're going to use parents around the parameters. And uh, if, uh, if this is just an expression on the uh, right-hand side that you're going to return, you don't need to use uh, curly braces to uh, denote a, a block of code and the return keyword is optional. Uh, but otherwise, if you've got several statements, etc., you, you have to use uh, curly braces and use the return keyword explicitly. Uh, when, up oh, the parents, and uh, another example of using uh, lambda expression with here uh, streams. So you imagine you have a, a stream of ins from one to a hundred, and you want to iterate over all of them, or you want to retrieve all the uh, the lines of a file, and you want to uh, turn the lines into uppercase, then print them. Again, uh, you can just replace and use groovy closure instead, and it will work just uh, the same. So you don't necessarily need to use the groovy added methods to collections, you can use the, the streaming approach. But, um, oh yeah, something uh, I forgot to mention. So this is this little bubble. Um, when you use uh, the closure to functional interface coercion mechanism, we go a little bit beyond what Java 8 provides because uh, for Java 8, Java 8, it's only functional interfaces. So it's not working with, let's say, abstract classes with one single abstract method. Uh, whereas in Groovy, the coercion mecha mechanism is a bit wider. It goes a bit beyond because it also works with uh, abstr abstract classes with one single abstract method. Beyond uh, lambdas, uh, some other things that Groovy closures do, because I want to show you where Groovy goes beyond or does thing, uh, some things differently. Um, we have this ability to define a default parameter for uh, uh, the, the, the closure parameters. So let's say uh, I define a, a malt closure. So I can assign that into a variable. Uh, if, if that had been you know, Java 8, I would have needed some functional interface to put that lambda expression into. Here, it's a closure, groovy lang closure class instance. And notice here that the second parameter, b equals 10. So if you call uh, malt with two parameters, uh, two goes into a, three into b, etc. So we get six. But if you call the closure with just one parameter, it will fill the value of the b of the second parameter with the default value. So it's something uh, in addition to what Lambda would provide. Um, another interesting aspect, thing, um, since Groovy is a dynamic language by nature, although you can do static type checking, static compilation, etc., uh, but by nature I would say it's a, a dynamic language. Uh, when you don't specify the types of your parameters, but you assume that those two parameters can be added together because you use the plus sign. You can actually pass any kind, any type of uh, parameters. So here I can add 100 and 200, but since there's a plus operation, a plus method, uh, or the groovy uh, runtime knows that you can add two strings together to concatenate them, then you can also uh, do that plus operation on those two different things. Because, I mean, a number and a string, a part deriving from object, there's no common uh, ancestor to, to those two. So I couldn't define uh, anything else than object as the type of those two uh, closure parameters. So it works both for numbers and for strings and anything that actually has got a PLUS method. So you can define your own uh, operator of loading by following certain naming conventions. Something I'd like to show you also with closures, it's our notion of builders. So it's not, uh, you know, fluent API kind of builders, but builders to create uh, uh, hierarchical data structures. So uh, Groovy provides uh, different builders uh, for building swing UIs, for building XML payloads or JSON content, etc. And we are going to look at an example of a builder um, which 
I will write with a Java 8 approach using Lambda expression and what it would look like uh, with a Groovy approach. So this is uh, inspired by an article I found on uh, DZone, uh, which was trying to mimic the, um, the Groovy builders, basically, but with Lambda expression. So this is uh, a kind of builder for creating a, a POM, uh, like a, you know, a Maven POM. So uh, you would have different methods like L to create elements or uh, attributes with LX, etc. And you see that we use uh, closures, uh, lambda expressions, sorry. I'm so used to saying closures that uh, I still, I'm still not used to saying lambda. Uh, lambda expressions, so when a lambda expression doesn't take any parameter, you still have to use a parents, parents, arrow on the, the body of the lambda which is a bit more verbose, I would say. Uh, but the, the particular uh, interesting aspect with the, the Groovy variant I'm going to show you is that uh, you can actually um, deal with uh, the delegation strategy, so a method or a property which is accessed inside a closure. You can say, okay, call a method coming from a certain context, etc. You can customize that kind of thing. So I don't, I'm not going to go into details about that but show you uh, what it would look like uh, in Groovy instead. So instead of repeating all the time POM L or POM LX, and instead of having that more, slightly more verbose notation when you have zero arguments uh, to pass to your lambda, a Groovy variant would look like this, uh, because I can say, I can uh, instruct the, the POM builder class that those method calls, these are model version, group ID, etc., are actually method calls. Uh, those method calls would be called on, let's say, the POM builder. I can define the delegate of that closure to say, okay, those method calls or property accesses should be delegated to something else. Here, the, the POM builder. And notice that when uh, I pass uh, closure, I don't need to use the parents, parents arrow because uh, a closure without parameters uh, is, just looks like, like a curly braces delimited block of code. And uh, it's actually, in my opinion, more readable than the other variant, especially because of the fact you don't have to repeat POM L, POM LX, etc., uh, because of this delegation strategy approach that Groovy closures provide. So hopefully, I hope you agree that Groovy builders are more readable than what we could mimic with lambda expressions. And to those who might think otherwise, <laughs> you know the story. Um, let's uh, muscle our uh, brain cells a little bit. Uh, so we're still on the topic of closures. Um, Closures, uh, since we have a closure type, we can also add methods to uh, the closure class. And for instance, one of uh, those methods is memoize, to memoize the outcome of previous invocations of the closure. So when you do something like a Fibonacci uh, function, you're going to call, uh, so for Fibonacci n, you're going to call Fibonacci n minus 1, n minus 2, and uh, Fibonacci of n minus 1 is going to call uh, Fibonacci of n minus 1 minus 1, which is n minus 2, so you're going to call uh, recursively uh, Fibonacci way too many times. So with memoization, with that pattern, uh, the, 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 groovy, uh, the groovy closures can remember the outcome of previous invocations so that the next time you call Fibonacci of uh, 35, it's going to return 35 from a cache rather than recalculate and redo the, uh, the recursive calls. And we also have that uh, Ability not just for closures, but we also have what we call an AST transformation, a cut transformation for methods, so that you can annotate um, a, a method with at memoized, and it's going to do the same thing for methods as well. Do you know what I'm going to talk about with this picture? Tail recursion, tail recursion yes. <laughs> So tail recursion, we have uh, a method called trampoline, which can somehow, uh, so factorial is again uh, an example of a recursive method. 
And the problem with uh, recursive method, in particular, if you do factorial, you know, of 1,000 or, or, or a much bigger number, is that uh, you're going to quickly uh, blow the stack because, uh, well, you'll get a stack overflow error because you've got too many, uh, too nested uh, call stack. And uh, the, you, you can use that trampoline call somehow to, um, to do the invocations uh, serially rather than recursively. And we also have the same thing uh, since Groovy 2.3 uh, with the HT transformation called tail recursive, which does the same thing for methods as well. So we try to do uh, the same things for closures and for methods. And um, uh, so you can use at tail recursive, which is new in 2.3. Uh, uh, the, the little thing I'd like to mention as well, which is somehow a drawback of uh, doing uh, tail recursion, is that for proper tail recursion, the, uh, the last thing needs to be, the, the last expression of uh, the closure or the method needs to be the recursive call. So if you write uh, factorial more uh, intuitively, and you do uh, n times uh, trampoline uh, n minus one. Uh, the tail code cannot really take place because the last uh, operation is actually the multiplication of n and uh, trampoline. So instead, I've slightly rewritten those examples uh, using an accumulator so that the real, the, the last call is actually the tail rec call. So it's got the drawback of sometimes perhaps you might have to you know update the uh, the way you've written the algorithm so that you really have something which is tail recursive. In um, method references, we're going to speak about that now. Uh, when you do you know something like uh, Swing or some other uh, API that requires some action listeners, etc. Uh, what's nice is that you can um, pass, uh, or imagine you can pass uh, a listener in, in the form of a, a lambda expression. And the idea of method references is, is in, instead of passing a lambda expression, you can actually pass somehow a, a reference over a method. So uh, this is going to call system out println with the, the, the parameter uh, which is passed to uh, the lambda normally. So notice this notation with the double colon. And actually, so there are three uh, main cases. So you can have a, a method reference over an instance method of a specific instance, a static method of a class, or an instance method of some class. So there are three cases for method references. In uh, Groovy, we actually have already a similar, uh, let's say, operator. This is dot on percent, but it actually covers only the first two cases, so we don't have uh, the last case available. So the, the question that, uh, I mean, the groovy core developers will uh, wonder about is, what should we be doing? Should we uh, just ditch our old uh, method closure reference syntax? Because this is uh, returning a, a closure, actually, that you can pass as parameter, etc., of methods. Should we support both syntaxes, or should you know deprecate one uh, or enhance the one we already have? The the question is still open, and some have voiced uh, in the Groovy community that they'd prefer to use the Java syntax instead. Why not? That's a possibility. Although what's interesting, as I mentioned with the example with builders, is that with Groovy closures you actually have a bit more control on on those closure expressions because you can define a delegation strategy and do some other advanced stuff that I haven't covered. Next, um, static methods in interfaces. Uh, so um, let's say I, I've taken inspiration from the stream API. So this is, a, I think, a slightly uh, simplified example because the, I think the generics is a bit more complicated in the real stream API, uh, uh, interface. But just so you get the idea. So in Java 8 now you can, uh, so this is Java. In Java 8 you can put static methods uh, into interfaces, uh, like interesting utility uh, functions, like the kind of method you would usually put in a utility class, like the collections class in, uh, in the JDK. 
And you can also have default methods. Uh, so notice the reuse of the default keyword uh, to say, okay, this is a default method. If you don't implement it in the class implementing the interface, then you'll be provided with this default implementation. That's a nice way to extend and enrich existing interfaces without breaking compilation uh, because well, I was using that version of the interface and now there's a new method and I'm not implementing all the methods and that kind of problems. So th these two things are definitely something we'll need uh, to implement as well because for interoperability with Java uh, it's going to be needed. But Groovy also has something which is a bit similar. So this is Groovy Traits. So traits exist in other uh, languages as well. It's not something specific to Groovy. So it's a bit like, <coughs> excuse me, it's a bit like interfaces, uh, but with method bodies. So in that way, it's similar to uh, Java 8 interface default methods. It's a nice way of composing uh, uh, behavior because you can uh, get beha behavior from different traits into your your own classes. But our traits can be stateful, something you cannot really do with uh, default methods and interfaces. They also work fine with our ability to do static typing, static compilation, etc. And there's a, a particularity which is interesting, you can also implement traits at runtime. But there's a, a little gotcha that I'll mention. So here's an example of traits. So this is, it looks like basically a, a class somehow, but we use a trait keyword here. I think I've got, no, I don't have little bubbles. Um, so this looks like a class. It's got a, a method here, fly. And then my bird uh, class here is going to implement that trait. So when I inst instantiate my bird, I can call fly on it. So it looks a bit like, you know, uh, extending a class, but here under the hood, uh, well, here it's a trait, it's not a class. Let's hear a slightly... Uh, more interesting case, this is with state. So here I have a named trait with a groovy property. So you see string name. Uh, if your class implements that trait, you're going to have a, a getter and a setter for the name uh, property. And you can use Groovy's uh, named parameter uh, default constructor, and you can use the uh, shortcut syntax for accessing properties. So instead of calling b.getName, you can say, as usual in Groovy, b.name equals colibri. This is the, uh, the French name for the human bird. Another example is what happens with multiple inheritance. So here, what's going to be interesting is that um, and notice that I have a hipster class that actually already extends a concrete class, class person, and then I implement two traits, a kite surfer and a web surfer. Both surfers, well, they surf, right? So one for browsing the web, the other on the waves. So what happens when you call surf on the hipster instance there, on the H variable? Well, the last trait actually wins. That's the convention we've chosen. We could have chosen to, you know, throw a compilation error. No, we decided to uh, make the last trait win. So if you want to, you know, have the other order, you could invert uh, kite surfer and web surfer in the implements clause. Or if you really want to be explicit, you can do like in uh, Java 8 with default method, methods. You can say uh, kite surfer dot super dot surf. You can do that. Um, and um, tomorrow, at the same time, I have a, a talk which dives more into the new features of Groovy 2, 3, 2, 4 and beyond. And if you want to get more details about those things, I invite you to come to uh, my other session tomorrow. So another thing from uh, Java 8, it's uh, about related to annotations, actually two things. Uh, repeating annotations, so that's how you can put twice or more uh, times the, uh, the same annotation on something. And annotations on times. You can put annotations in way more places than before. So let's have a concrete look at that. So here, um, let's say you have a method that you want to schedule at, uh, you know, with like a cron, uh, uh, you know, in a cron way. Uh, you want to do periodic cleanup uh, uh, like every uh, last day of the month and every Friday at uh, 11 p.m., okay? So before Java 8, you had to have some kind of wrapper uh, or container annotation that would contain 
those two annotations. So add schedules contains an array of uh, schedule annotations. So you would define uh, like uh, so this is the, um, the 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 this annotation here, and you need up oh, this one. You need this schedules uh, container annotation, which is an array of schedule annotations. So this is how. Uh, you have to do it, and if you want to use it before Java 8, you have to, to be explicit and use add schedules, and inside you pass the two, uh, the two schedule annotations. But now it's a kind of shortcut. You still need the container. You need to have the container available, but to uh, be able to, you know, without further boilerplate code or without explicitly using add schedules, you have to annotate your schedule uh, annotation with add repeatable. Okay. Currently, uh, we haven't implemented that, but it's certainly something we'll be uh, also supporting in Groovy, Groovy 2.4 or beyond. We haven't yet uh, scheduled that. And uh, some the other aspect I mentioned about annotation in Java 8 is the ability to put annotations anywhere you can expect a type. So on a, on a local variable, a field, etc., you can add an annotation. Even in cast expressions, you can put an annotation inside a cast expression. Doesn't it look weird, right? So it's quite unusual. We'll we'll get used to it. Uh, in generics, uh, even when you do a new Call, that's uh, yeah, kind of weird. Or again, uh, when you throw an exception or in the um, throws uh, declaration or implements, so you'll be able to you know program by annotations basically. <laughs> um, currently, again, it's uh, something we haven't implemented, but uh, we'll certainly implement that. And what's interesting is that uh, so I told you briefly about uh, AST transformations. And local AST transformations in particular in Groovy, those code transformations are triggered by annotations. So you have to annotate something so that the, um, the, the, the transformation is being applied and, and called and triggered. Uh, so that means that it's also going to be interesting for Groovy itself because it means there will be more uh, places where you, you'll be able, you ha you ha you'll have a finer granularity for where you want to apply uh, a certain code transformation. Uh, so that's going to be pretty useful for uh, Groovy library authors, etc. So it's something we'll have to implement. Something that Groovy provides, though, that's not available with uh, Java 8 uh, annotations is, is our mechanism for meta annotations. So you've got many frameworks which support way of doing yeah, meta annotations, kind of uh, annotations, representing all their annotations, but usually it's specific to those frameworks. Uh, in Groovy, let's say you have many services that you want to implement, which are actually at service and at transactional at the same time. So instead of repeating, so this is not too verbal because it's just two annotations, but imagine something that is you know, like 10 annotations, but always the same annotations on all the domain classes of your application or something like that. So when you uh, do add service at transactional all the time, uh, Groovy does a, uh, let you define a meta annotation which kind of wraps those two uh, annotations and replaces the meta annotation with the right annotations at compile time. So this is uh, done with our annotation collector. So you can say, OK, I define my new annotation, which is actually going to contain or represent at service and at transactional at the same time. So instead of uh, doing what's here uh, in the uh, upper left corner, you're going to be able to say at transactional service. And actually, in, in the bytecode, you will not have at transactional service, but you will have at service and at transactional. So it's really a compile time thing. That's the Java compiler, the Groovy C, sorry, the Groovy C compiler that does the replacement of the meta annotation with the right uh, annotations. So you don't need particular uh, framework support for that. And also, uh, this is a trivial example, but um, you can also handle uh, things like uh, if you've got 
annotations, taking parameters, but they are conflicting. Let's say uh, they have value and value, or mean and mean, or whatever. Uh, you can also handle those, those kind of things quite elegantly by uh, using the annotation collector in a more advanced way. We've spoken about the syntax elements, but uh, in Java 8 you also have new APIs like the date and time API. So this is a brief example of the kind of things you can do to create a local date uh, or to do uh, arithmetics on dates, like you want to remove two days. Uh, what else? You can adjust, uh, let's say, the, dex, uh, the, the date to find the next Wednesday following the, the current date, etc. So you can use that from Groovy, uh, that's not a problem, of course. But Groovy uh, could help there, uh, thanks to operator of loading. So that's what we did with the, the old Java time uh, API. So this is a, an example using the, the time category, which adds uh, certain, for instance, properties to numbers, etc. So you can say something like two years plus three months, plus five, 15 days, etc. You can do arithmetics like one week minus uh, one day or do three days ago. Um, this is the kind of stuff uh, we can do also with the new date time API. So again, we haven't implemented that, but that's something we are planning to do so that you can have something which is uh, you know, more readable in terms of how you deal with the uh, dates and calendars, etc. but with the new date time API. <clears throat> the stream API, well, we've already mentioned it, basically, so the, you know, the stream, map, reduce kind of stuff. Um, so this is uh, how I explain the map reduce to uh, my daughter, how to make sandwiches. Uh, so I, I, won't, I will be uh, fast through that one because we've already seen it, but as I'm mentioning APIs as well, let me just say it again. So uh, here you have a collection of person. You're going to get a stream. Then you can filter, map, sort, and uh, join everything together afterwards. So again, what's nice is that you can either use the way um, the, uh, the the usual. Uh, actually, actually, it's not joining. It's join the usual. Um, API uh, provided by the GDK, the Groovy Development Kit, or you can use the uh, the stream API right from uh, the stream from Java 8 with Groovy closures instead of Lambda expressions. That's what I already explained. Except that we go a bit beyond because it's not just with functional interfaces, but as well with abstract classes. And another uh, class which is part of the JDK, it's optional. Uh, so it, it's a kind of wrapper object uh, around some type, which is mm, so something which has got a value or is null. But it forces you, if you want to get to that uh, internal value of the, that optional boxed object, you have to be explicit and deal with it. So either by using uh, may be name or else, which is a default value. So if you want to get the result, so you get either the result inside the optional or you get unknown. Or you have to be explicit and say if, uh, if present or otherwise do something else. And then you can go uh, call a dot get, etc. Uh, in, uh, in Groovy, we, we can also use optional uh, directly. Uh, if you're running on Java 8, you know, on, on JDK 8. So you can just do the same thing as uh, you do with Java. But uh, Groovy uh, supports some interesting things, uh, which is the Groovy truth. You can even customize the truth in Groovy if you follow certain uh, uh, naming conventions. And uh, thanks to an as boolean method, just like it's a bit like operator overloading when you do plus method. Uh, here, if a type has got an as boolean method, you can coerce a certain uh, instance of that type into a boolean expression. I'm going to show you what it looks like. And the other interesting aspect is that um, things which are Null, empty, zero sized, or equal to zero can be coerced into false and otherwise to true. So if you combine those things, so I'm not diving into the details, but if you combine those things together, and also the uh, infamous LVS operator, 
this is like a ternary operator, but uh, the, the value in the middle uh, is uh, squashed <laughs> in between the, the question mark and the column. So let's revisit what we could do with optional in a groovy way. So let's say you define uh, an optional. So you could use, instead of get or else, you could use the Elvis operator to get the default value uh, if the, uh, the optional is null. Or instead of uh, being more verbose and say maybe name if present, etc., you could just use truth coercion, the groovy truth, to say, okay, if it's not null, then do something. And also, uh, the, the, this last one is interesting. That's the, um, the safe uh, navigation operator. So when you, knew, when you use that in Groovy, if, uh, imagine that you chain A, uh, question mark dot B, question mark dot C, etc. Uh, if anything in the chain uh, is null, it's going to be uh, null. The results of that call is going to be null. So you don't have to do if the first thing is not null, then I call the second thing on the result then if it's not null, etc. So you don't have to use nested if statements. And by the way, it's uh, a feature that's been uh, borrowed uh, by the Apple Swift language. They borrowed that from Groovy. So it's nice to see that, you know, <laughs> uh, Apple took inspiration from Groovy. That's, uh, you know, um, we're very proud of that. Uh, so, uh, if the optional uh, is not null and con actually contains a thing, uh, then you could call to uppercase. So, you'd, you'd have a, a nice shortcut leveraging the groovy truth, uh, the, um, uh, the groovy truth, the Elvis operator, and the safe navigation operator. So, you could make optional even nicer uh, when you use groovy. The Elvis operator, yeah, the groovy truth, uh, because I transform an optional into a Boolean expression, and here the safe navigation. There was a, an interesting discussion on our mailing list about that, if you're interested in, in some more background. And it's not implemented, but something uh, we might be doing. So this part is more about the things we <laughs> didn't yet implement, but will at some point. Um, so in terms of APIs, um, there's uh, the, uh, a new implementation of the JavaScript um, language and uh, scripting engine inside um, the JDK 8 with the NASHORN uh, implementation. So I think NASHORN is uh, the German for uh, uh, a rhinoceros, right? Uh, so it's funny because, you know, you're on the JVM, you can write in Groovy and call some JavaScript from Groovy, and you, you see that you've got some sane JavaScript logic, you know, you add an, an empty object to an empty list and it returns zero. The, the Groovy doesn't do that kind of thing, so you're, you're safer <laughs> with Groovy. And uh, so it's funny because you can, you know, call JavaScript from Groovy. Um, and I wanted to mention something else, which is GrooScript, which is a, a project uh, from the community, which is actually our Groovy to JavaScript compiler. So nowadays, a language is not uh, deemed modern if it doesn't have uh, a JavaScript uh, transpiler. So we have GrooScript, uh, which actually uh, lets you translate Groovy uh, into JavaScript and even support some of the metaprogramming, etc. So it's uh, quite advanced. And uh, what's nice is that on the website, if you go to groovescript.org, you'll find tons of uh, samples with Node.js, with React.js, etc. So all written in Groovy, but behind it's using those uh, frameworks and JavaScript uh, libraries. And it's got also uh, plugins for Gradle and Grails, which are available. So it's funny because in the um, APIs, you, you can see, in the examples, sorry, uh, you can see uh, a Groovy, you know, in the browser, etc. So you can have uh, full Groovy uh, in the front end, in the back end, and everywhere. So for those who like to work with a single language, uh, it, it can be interesting. JavaFX, um, so it's deemed to be the, the new uh, swing. Uh, are there some JavaFX users, by the way, in the, in the room? Yeah, one, two, yeah, three, okay. Uh, not that many. Um, 
So there's a project called Groovy FX. So here I'm, I'm speaking also about the, uh, some of the uh, ecosystem uh, projects. Uh, if you remember, at some point, uh, Rackle did Java FX uh, script, that was called, uh, which was a new language for dealing with uh, uh, the Java FX uh, API and uh, libraries. And uh, if, in fact, Groovy FX. Uh, is using the, the, the builder approach to define uh, a new uh, stage, a new scene, and how uh, different components are nested within each other. And the fact we use Groovy closures, uh, and you see, and a Groovy builder approach, you see how those components are nested within each other. So it's nice for, uh, again, tree structured data, hierarchical data. Um, so if you use JavaFX, it's perhaps something you might want to have a look at with a Groove Builder. And beyond Java, uh, so when I say Java, it's not just, uh, let's say, Java the language or uh, APIs, but also the, uh, uh, the ecosystem. So for instance, Android. In, uh, since Groovy 2.4, the, the, so the, the latest version is 2.4 Beta 3, so we haven't uh, released the final version of 2.4, uh, but it's uh, totally stable and uh, you can use it uh, without uh, any worry. Uh, we added support for Android, so you can now write Android applications in Groovy. And uh, Cédric Champeau, near the, the first uh, <laughs> rank over there, uh, will be doing a talk on Groovy on Android on Friday morning, if you want to get the details. Uh, so an example is the, the New York Times, which recently announced that they are going to use uh, Groovy as well as Rx Java for making their applications more uh, reactive. So there's a, uh, that's a link to uh, the article, New York Times dash Groovy. And uh, they, they were explaining that basically uh, in, in Java, on Android, uh, you use a lot, a lot of uh, anonymous you know, classes everywhere. So instead of doing that in Java, they can do that in Groovy, uh, thanks to uh, closures and the coercion of closures into uh, functional interfaces and abstract classes. So it makes the code more concise. And um, the other things they mentioned is that uh, the code can be as type safe uh, as Java, because you can use the at type checked uh, directive, the type checked annotations on your Groovy code, or you can even use at compile static, which, which compiles your code statically, bypassing the, the Groovy runtime to have code which is as fast as Java. Yes, Groovy can be as fast as Java as needed. And uh, there are some sample applications available, but uh, Cedric will give more details about those things um, and more demos as well on Friday. And Groovy, we already mentioned some ec ecosystem projects, but uh, you, you have interesting frameworks like web frameworks, like Grails. So with this simple uh, uh, domain class annotated with those few um, uh, annotations. Uh, you can build a full-blown RESTful application in Grails, and then you just uh, Grails run up, and uh, uh, when you install the, the Grails SDK, with just one class, we've got a RESTful application for that entity class. Uh, Ratpack is a new uh, Netty-based uh, framework, which is nice for uh, reactive applications, etc. And it's even implementing the reactive streams. Um, uh, I was going to say manifesto, the, the reactive stream uh, uh, APIs. Uh, so it's uh, pretty lightweight and uh, super efficient, super fast. You've got Griffin, uh, which is uh, a bit like Grails, but for desktop applications. So you can define models, you can define uh, controllers, so it's the MVC approach that I am showing, basically. And you can define a view, just like with GroovyFX. So you actually can use GroovyFX, you can use Swing, you can use some other, uh, the Eclipse uh, SWT toolkit, etc. You've got Spock, the Spock testing framework, which builds upon, uh, on top of uh, JUnit to provide some nice syntax, like um, this, uh, the, the, this reuse of uh, the labels uh, to demark different blocks, and also the, the weight using uh, some advanced metaprogramming tricks with Groovy to, to have that kind of you know, wiki-like syntax for defining uh, arrays. 
on tables. And what it's doing, it's actually a data-driven test because it's going to replace the values of A, B, and C directly. So you, you'll have you'll call that um, that, that expectation uh, for all those values and check that uh, the maximum of one and three, three, etc. So this is a, a pretty readable way uh, to do uh, data-driven tests. You've got Jeb for browser automation, so you can drive Chrome, Firefox, or HTML unit uh, with uh, also the uh, notice the jQuery-like syntax for accessing elements of a, a web page. You can also fill in uh, forms and click on buttons and uh, assert that uh, the, the text of the, uh, this H1 tag contains admin section once you've clicked on, on the login form. You've got Gradle. Uh, there's a talk on Gradle, I think it's tomorrow, by Hans Doctor, the founder of Gradle. <coughs> uh, so this is a, an example of a, a build file. So Gradle is being more and more used uh, for, for instance, for Android applications, for building Android applications, for even the builds of the Spring project or the Hibernate project are uh, using Gradle. So lots of folks are, are moving uh, from Maven to Gradle. Um, Jeepers, that's our uh, concurrency parallelism asynchronous solution. So you can do actors, you can do a software and transactional memory, you can do a, um, what else? Uh, well, there are many uh, concurrency parallelism async uh, routines and concepts. Uh, here it's just an actor example, but you've got many things uh, that you can do with the Jeepers library, and it's part of the Groovy uh, distribution. So it's not part of the Groovy APIs per se, but it's part of the Groovy distribution when you download Groovy. Yes, ESP, uh, data flow concurrency, that's one which is really nice. And uh, some simplifications of the, the fork join uh, APIs, etc. And uh, as well as, uh, so it's back into the, the APIs uh, with the Groovy modules. So as part of, uh, when, when you download uh, the, the Groovy distribution, you also have the, those, those modules available, among other, other things. So you've got special modules for uh, working with JMX, with uh, JSON, with XML, etc. With templating, let's have a look at some of them. So this is a, a quick example of the end builder from the end module on the XML module. So here I have an example where I'm actually creating some markup, some HTML, and I'm going to call the, the mail task uh, from end to be able to send an email and define an email with the, the from to message, uh, define attachments, etc. So it's very nice for uh, scripting, and Groovy is often used for uh, scripting to automate certain tasks. So this is combining two modules. Another example is uh, the JSON support. So just like the HTML uh, or Markup Builder, uh, the XML uh, builders, <coughs> excuse me, we have the same thing for JSON. So here it's going to uh, create the following JSON payload. We also, so this is for building JSON, but you can also consume JSON. Uh, this one is pretty powerful because you can say, uh, so you define a, a parser, a JSON parser, and you can, you can parse uh, the text of that remote URL. So this is actually doing an HTTP get, uh, because if you do call dot .text or get text, it's a shortcut for the get text method, it's actually going to do an HTTP get method uh, without having you know, to use a URL connection and that kind of things, or uh, Apache uh, HTTP client, or that kind of things. And the other powerful aspect is that you don't have to uh, do any kind of marshalling, uh, thanks to the fact that Groovy is a dynamic language. So uh, no matter the payload that you are parsing, uh, no matter the JSON content, you can access, if you know what that JSON uh, looks like, you can access the, the first element of the array, the JSON array, which is return, the commit object, the author object, the name property of that object, and get like the, 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 the name of the latest commit, of the committer of the latest commit on the Groovy code base. Uh, I don't know if it's Cedric, but uh, it might be someone else, and it might be Cedric. 
at least the, when I wrote that example, that was the case. So it's pretty powerful because you know, in just uh, two lines of code, you can do uh, rest, restful calls and parsing uh, without having to create uh, a full object graph representing commits, authors, etc. And we also have a new markup. Temp so we had uh, template engines, but in uh, Groovy 2.3, we added a, a new markup template engine, so based on the same principle of uh, the, the markup uh, builder, uh, which supports uh, internationalization and can be uh, statically compiled so that it's super fast at rendering, etc. And it's also integrated in Spring Boot, by the way. So the idea is that you have a, some kind of uh, such uh, template with a builder approach. So you've got a, a cars tag and you iterate over a list of cars and then you uh, output car uh, tags. And then you define a model and then you can feed that model to your template and then it's going to create that kind of XML. And this is how you can do that. You create the, the engine, create the template, and call the, the methods. So back to our original question. Do we still need Groovy now that we have Java 8? So I hope that through those examples, I showed that uh, Groovy is not just uh, Java plus Lambda expressions, but Groovy goes way beyond in terms of uh, simplifying the syntax, providing nice shortcuts, adding new uh, interesting libraries, and uh, coming with a rich ecosystem of projects. So I hope uh, for you too the answer to this question is yes, we still need Groovy because Groovy continues to innovate and uh, provide uh, useful tools in your tool, bet, to, tool belt to make you more productive. And the, uh, well, the, the longest answer is, the, is twofold. Yes, because of uh, the synergy, the fact that uh, when you use Groovy and Java 8 together, you can do even more things. So you can benefit from the nice aspects like of the, uh, the, the, the stream API, how efficient it is, etc. You can build on top of that. Uh, because the, it, yeah, the, it's a synergy in the sense that uh, if you combine everything, Java 8, existing libraries, modules, etc., uh, from the Groovy ecosystem, uh, you're going to really use a very powerful platform. And the other remark is that uh, we always try to go slightly beyond what Java provides, like our closure to uh, uh, our closure coercion mechanism goes beyond just functional interfaces, but we we'll work with abstract classes, etc. So we'll, we're always trying to provide a bit more than what Java 8 or Java X offers. So there are still things, uh, questions which are still open uh, for future versions of Groovy, of course, so which uh, elements of the syntax we should be supporting or not. So your feedback is interesting. Again, don't hesitate to uh, like ping me on uh, Twitter at GLAForge or on our mailing list, etc. So we are really uh, eager to uh, hearing from you about, about that. And um, there are further possible API enhancements, like the example I, I gave with the optional class, and uh, things like operator of loading for the date time API, etc. And your feedback is more than welcome, and your contributions even more so. So don't hesitate to come uh, to you know contribute to the project. So thanks a lot to your, for your attention, and I'm happy to take a couple of questions. We have three minutes left. Any question? Yeah, one. The what? Sorry. Jeb. Oh, Jeb. Yeah, Jeb. Uh, Jeb. Um, it's actually. Uh, so I don't remember how it's implemented. It's using Selenium under the hood. So uh, it's a kind of you know new layer, new layer on top of uh, of that, and using uh, the, the the Chrome browser, the uh, Firefox browser, the HTML unit browser uh, from from Selenium. Yeah. So you can specify the browser, yes. No more question? Or one more here? 
Yeah, the JSON parser is actually the, the, the fastest one. So uh, in GUI 2.3, it's been uh, totally rewritten. And uh, it's been compared to JSON as well as Jackson. And uh, at least on the, um, the, the benchmarks that we, uh, we tried, uh, it was consistently faster, either uh, same speed or two, three times faster sometimes. So it's indeed very, very fast. So if you want a very fast parser, uh, it's, a, it's a good choice. <laughs> Other questions? No. Well, thanks a lot for your attention.